Hello and welcome to Seven Robots Fantastically Terrible Podcast. <laughs> Today's episode is about research. No way. I'm going to take a little quote from The Big Lebowski and say research is like the rug that ties the room together. <laughs> So for us, research is fun. It's yes. not work. It's not like I'm researching my midterm. Yeah, I like, I love using Google, like the equivalent of an eight. Research is more than Google. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But I, I love using Google like an eight ball. <laughs> so I'll think of something really stupid and I'll just Google it. <laughs> you know, can spiders fly? Google that. Wow. Damn, actually, they can fly. They can fly. Yeah. Uh, you know, like whatever question. It's like being a kid. No, it's true. I, I search life. for anything that I have in mind. But then you got to build from that because Google's not good enough. The, yeah. the net helps me just to see what's out there and then I narrow down what I like. Mm -hmm. And then I research that. But t I tend to do everything either online or, you know, videos, lectures, whatever. Wherever things lead me. Right. And we're really into mythology and Absolutely. from all over the world. Yep. And we have books. I wish we had more, but we have books from as many countries as we can get our hands on. Mm -hmm. They have so much inspiration and weird things happen. <laughs> well, what's interesting too, like you take African. Uh, African oh storytelling is very cool. Whole, you're right. I have a whole thing that I need you to draw on with African mythology. Right. And Indian. Wow. Indian yeah. mythology is awesome. But what's cool about African is that... He has a crisis. He has a crisis. And he nice, needs to decide between two and things. it isn't ended by the storyteller, by him telling you how it should end. That's a good point. A lot of African mythology will yeah. present you the with folklore. a scenario. Mm -hmm. It's like you choose the ending books. <laughs> yeah, but it's a dis it becomes a community discussion, right? Which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I find Celtic mythology also is very cool too. Oh, it's it's great. Bad you know. tempered heroes, mm -hmm. Cuchulain, or I, I never say his name correctly, but Maeve. Oh, uh, Maeve. She's Maeve, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, with the cows. Uh, <laughs> the strong woman. And, and it's interesting because they're discovering more and more that a lot of these tales, whether it was Vikings or it was Celts. That women actually did fight. Well, that well, you're tying us in nicely to our web comic, Wolf Boy and the Magical Warriors. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let's do that then. So we we do like research, particularly mm -hmm. mythology, but we often get into his, history and historical events, mm -hmm. and it depends on the story. But if we stick to one, just for an example, Wolf Boy and the Magical Warriors, mm -hmm. which you can read for free on Webtoon. Mm -hmm. It's family friendly. There's three main characters. Mm -hmm. One is Wolf Boy. One is Monkey King from Chinese mythology, mm -hmm. from their classic book, Journey to the West. And then we have Tessie the Amazon. Just as you were saying, now archaeologists, more and more, and I'll have a link to this on our website, are finding women and young women, as young as 13, 15, who are warriors. That in yeah. the past, they assumed were men. Yeah. And it's, it's, but you hear it in the folk tales. You hear it in the mythology. You kind of think, well, they made it up. Yeah, it's maybe some aspects they might have made up, but there's other aspects that they didn't. That's right. So in Wolf Boy, uh, we call her Tessie, but she's based on an Amazon warrior called Penteselea. Penteselea. So I, I shortened that to Tessie. Yes. Because we were thinking Penny maybe, but we're like, no, that's not good. So yeah, we shortened it to not... Tessie. And in Greek mythology, she's the daughter of the god of war, Ares, mm -hmm. and Otera. I'm not mm -hmm. sure where to put the accent on that. And she was queen of the Amazons. Mm -hmm. And Penteselea led an army of Amazons to Troy to fight the Greeks. Yep. So when I researched her, I thought, wow, that's a really cool character. What if we have her as a young preteen? Right. Trying to figure things out, hot-tempered but trying to find her way, trying to be responsible. And she has to deal with uh, someone who thinks he's a wolf. And that came from you <laughs> reading a book That's on the right. dogmen. Yeah, she actually, in, in Greek, one of, you know, Greek history, Greek mythology always has multiple versions. Yeah. But in one of them, she kills Achille. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and Zeus had to bring back Achille. So I thought that was cool. So she's very powerful. And I thought, wouldn't it be... <laughs> <laughs> As you said, she has to deal with Wolf Boy, and your idea for Wolf Boy is quite funny. Yes, I was reading a book on 
It was called Dogmen, something out of the mythology of Dogmen. Myths of the Dogman by David Gordon White. That book, exactly. And I misread something, uh, Two-Headed She-Wolf. I was like, two heads? And then I started thinking, and then I, I read it again. I'm like, oh, no, it isn't. But I'm like, well, that be It's cool. one wolf with two, two twin boys, Romulus and Remus. Right. The founders of and Rome. I was, and, if you've... and instead of thinking that, you thought two-headed she-wolf. Right. I love the idea. We're like, oh, <laughs> you totally have to go with... Yeah, so that's where Valupa, the mother, was born. And what's interesting is that I was really thinking, you know, there's a lot of stories of, like, wolf children. And if you actually have studied, you know, Psychology 101... They talk to you about uh, children who've been raised in the wild. Mm -hmm. It's next to impossible to socialize them. So I think I was thinking, what if he just thought he was a wolf and he's going to be this hero? And like the idea that Rome was founded by children raised by a wolf was just hilariously ridiculous to me. It's true. He would be a little funny in the head. Right. He wouldn't be a normal human. He would still. So in our character, he still thinks he's a wolf. He has no idea he's human. Right. His friends, the Monkey King and Tessie, humor him. Right. Because it's he's a little too stupid to understand. <laughs> yeah. He's the biggest idiot you'll ever love. Right. Because and, he's so sweet and good right. of heart and loyal. But I was thinking, like, who's raised by wolves and creates a whole civilization? That's ridiculous. I think we do that a lot. This is our trick. We read mythology, think, critique it, and make it funny. Right. Think of it from a perspective of, like, really? Like... Like one You're day, by wolves? one day we we have in our back pocket a little. Uh, p- uh, we're playing with some Greek mythology because Zeus is a jerk twenty four seven. Yes, he is. He deserves He's some of that. He's awful, back. <laughs> and we need to write something. That, right. And in general, all the male Greek gods are awful. awful. Completely. And we really need to show this. And there are a lot of stories that people love where there's some romance or something. And I'm like, no, 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 none of that. So Kidnapping a woman and forcing her to ha- be in a relationship with you is not romantic. It's called stalking. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst other things. The other character is Monkey King. Mm-hmm. Now, Monkey King came about after we had thought of Wolf Boy. Yeah, you. the initial was Wolf Boy with you after your little mistake with mm-hmm. the... Uh, Romulus and Remus myth. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, let's bring in some Asian mythology. Why not? Right? We'll stick to the ancient world, but we'll open it up a little bit. Right. To include the East. Exactly. Because it's Eurasia, not just Europe. (laughs) They're all connected. Yeah, there's no sea that splits them up. And so, of course, the most famous, uh, super famous in all of Asia, and of course we know him here as well, is the Monkey King, which, as I mentioned, comes from Journey to the West which is one of the four great classic novels of Chinese literature. Great book. And Monkey King, his real name is Sun Wukong. He's the Chinese trickster god, and he drives the other gods crazy. So, of course, I love him because he drives them all crazy. But we made him older. So now he's dealing with with Wolf Boy. We put him in a situation where now he's not the craziest one in the mix. Right. He's got Wolf Boy. Right. And he loves Wolf Boy because he's so honest and so sweet and so pure of heart because he is oblivious. <laughs> to almost everything that's going on. And and so we took the trickster god who's usually causing trouble and put him in a situation where he actually has to be a little more responsible. Yeah, he's kind of like the parent, right? And then with Tessie, she just kind of accidentally, they accidentally bump into her. Right. And she needs to have epic battles in order to be a full Amazon. She's got to get experience points. She, exactly. Look, the three of them accidentally end up on Atlantis. Mm-hmm. And that's our first uh, graphic novel, which is on Webtoon, which you can read. It's called The Flushing of Atlantis. For Wolf Boy and the Magical Warriors, in addition to all three characters being tied to mythology, mm-hmm. we have uh, the <laughs> famous Schwarzenegger movie, Conan the Conan, Barbarian. which is also a very famous book in comics. Yes, and that's stuff. true. That's true. But I, I have love. to say, I haven't read the book or right. the books. It's based com- purely on the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, I guess in the movie it opens up with the before or after the waters drank Atlantis. And yeah, that was so funny. The narration yeah. in Conan the Barbarian, mm-hmm. the movie, we brought into our comic where the narrator is in the future discussing things that happened in the past that he witnessed. Right. 
and we set it up in the same way. Right. And I thought it was just ridiculous. Yeah, it was ridiculous. So. And and he his narration is a little bit too serious considering in our story, not in Conan the Barbarian the movie. That's meant but to be. in our yeah. story it's it's he sets it up like it's serious and then he's totally stupid. Yes. So you can't forget Conan. Can't. And the lamentation of the women. <laughs> the lamentation of the women. Oh my god. <laughs> So many good lines in that movie. It's written by Oliver Stone, by the way. Good for Oliver. I mean, I hope he inspires our slapstick versions of his work for a long time. What we'd like to do with this episode is show you how research directly links to your story. Right. So let's go to another story of ours called Past Due. Right. Completely different than Wolf Boy. Yes, much more serious and funny times, yeah. That's right. So why don't you describe what inspired your opening scene? Um, came from a very painful place. And what's interesting is that I was finishing up the second volume of Samurai Elf when I got a phone call from my mother telling me that my brother had cancer. And he was uninsured. And I felt like the, the bottom had been taken out from underneath me because there was no way I could financially help him. And... This is the U.S. as well. Yeah, this is when we were, I was living in New York. He was living in California. And healthcare costs are uh, it's crazy. astronomical, so I'm like thinking, you know, what's going to happen? And something hit me. There is this idea that people will do things for you altruistically. We feed this to children. And it's really unfair because by the time they grow up... Yeah, if you're good, someone will help you. If you try hard, if you work hard, right. someone will help you. And then there was something that was just sort of diametrically opposed in our culture so i had this vision of an image of a superhero on a ledge and this guy's hanging off a ledge and they're bartering over how much he was going to pay to be saved by the superhero Mm -hmm. and that's how past due which at one point we called super corporate heroes was born that's right so that's the opening scene in our story right and that was the one thing that set off this idea that a company based by uh, they had an insurance scheme where you had to pay into for superheroes. Yes. Yeah, so on Miguel's initial very heartfelt experience, which wasn't research, it was just his own personal experience, which yeah. inspired the story. Then I start that you know we started discussing mm-hmm. how can we develop this. Okay, if you have this superhero that charges, right? How can we flesh this out? Who does he work for? Right. What is this company? What do they do? What's this world like? That's right. So I started researching. We wanted to look at healthcare costs in the U.S. Right. uh, Without really talking about it, just showing it in a story. Yeah. So they are very similar to health insurance companies. And they're the sole, the only company that's allowed to have superheroes. This all developed. Yeah. Right. So I did some research on companies. For example, why do you pay for car insurance? So then I started thinking, how did they pass this kind of law where they made it mandatory to right. have to have this insurance? Because let's remember, in the U.S., it's not mandatory to have health insurance. No, it's not. And yet it's mandatory in almost every state to have car insurance. Right. We can get into this discussion maybe one day, but I find that I found that quite odd. So as I was researching, very interestingly, there was uh, fire department insurance. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we can't take for granted that uh, if your house is on fire, you call the fire department and they come. Mm-hmm. Historically, especially in Britain, you had to have insurance from a fire. I think it's still like this today. You have to have fire insurance. That's crazy. And back in the day, in front of your house or your apartment, you would have a medallion. Mm -hmm. And only your fire department would put out your fire. (sighs) So if there were multiple, they would compete. There are stories about competing fire departments who would or would not put out your fire, depending on who you had insurance with. Wow. Right? So it's like that idea of uh, negotiating like you were mentioning. So so I started looking at all this stuff. In the U.S., they did have that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like Benjamin Franklin during his period, they did have that. Uh, But in the U.S., they have a very strong tradition of voluntary volunteers. Yeah, and there's some states who... who, Oh, yes, yes. There's lots that still have that. So it, it was a service where because... 
it's like a sinking ship, especially in those days. If your house burns, your neighbor's house will burn, so everybody would pitch in. Uh, so it, there's a stronger tradition in the States of all for one and one for all, right? Everyone helps put out the fire. But there is that private insurance from England. Starting a couple of years ago, you do see celebrities who pay to have their mansions saved from California forest fires. So if there were superheroes, you'd it's pay for It's the same them. idea. It's that same idea that if you have the money, you can pay for insurance and they will help you even if they let everything else burn. That's insane. Yeah, I'll have links to that. Like Kim Kardashian, uh, that was a big story in 2018. Yeah, and there's a big movement now in California towards private insurance. We'll see how that debate. So this is how we're going to deal with, you know. Yeah, I know. It's a sad. I think it's a sad thing, but uh, it is historically. If you go back to England, it, they do have a it's precedent historic, for it's that. It's historically cuckoo yeah. for cocoa puffs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and the the most interesting I found was with the war on marijuana the really? marijuana laws interesting what did you what did you discover on well that? back so in the day you're doing and, research and it's just one thing is going to another is going to another hemp was openly used mm-hmm. whether it was to make uh, like the military actually was a big buyer in the u.s Didn't of they hemp. make ropes from it hemp ropes uh pharmacies doctors you name it would prescribe light doses of marijuana, which they called cannabis. I learned, which I didn't know, marijuana is a fake word right? that they used in order to have the Marijuana Act. They didn't want to say the Cannabis Act because they thought marijuana with a J-U-A-N-A sounded more Mexican. Keep so it at racist. They wanted, yeah, there's a lot of racism in that bill. They tied marijuana use to wow. foreigners and to... Black people and jazz musicians, even though at the time there was only one pharmacist who said, yes, it's addictive and bad for you. Every other professional in the medical industry said, no, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, it would be really hilarious. But anyways, if we continue. Okay, what was hilarious? If the people who were passing these laws were like massive marijuana smokers or cannabis smokers, that would just be like. They're kind of crazy. The epitome of hypocrisy. There's a couple of factors, but um, they had just ended alcohol prohibition, Uh, and they were kind of looking for something else to save their jobs. I'll have uh, links to all of the particular people. There were also big players who had money in the lumber industry. Mm -hmm. You had the DuPont family who had money into fibers and plastics, and they found hemp was such a cheap alternative. Um, And William Randolph... Hearst, who with his newspapers helped demonize marijuana. It's hilarious seeing the advertisements that they had. You gotta marijuana. love that the guy. It that... would make you go crazy. It would make you sterile. It would use. They had every single it, type it, it's of. It's funny crap. because today we talk about fake news, but that guy. Oh yeah, there. That guy, yellow fake journalism, news has is a long thing. history in the U.S. It's his thing. It's his thing. A very long history. Right. And um, you know the sinking of the Lusitania. Oh yeah. Long history of fake news. It's nothing new. And so what happened was they demonized hemp, cannabis, or as they would say, marijuana. So because it was so prevalent and so used, Mm -hmm. they had to convince people it was bad. And it took a lot of newspaper meeting coverage to convince people that it was bad. They fixed it so that you had to have a license in order to sell cannabis or to sell hemp. Right. To grow hemp. You needed a license. So just like you needed a medallion in order to have someone fight the fire in your house, Mm -hmm. you needed to have a license in order to sell hemp or cannabis. And uh, they made it so difficult to get this license that it eventually dried everything up. So there was no more. So there's no federal law saying you cannot grow this. But because they, that would have been too difficult at the time. So instead they said you need a license and they made the license nearly impossible to get. So it just shows you, historically speaking, insurance is often just what they force you to have. Right. Now, I'm not saying car insurance is bad. I'm not saying that. But it's just the way. It just shows the process. It shows the process. How things work. And then we took that process. We took that idea and we we have in past due, there's a lot of our financial background. Well, your financial background. In there. And building of monopolies and building of companies. Mm -hmm. So in the company... They have connections with the government. They they have lobbyists. 
we don't go through all of this. It's just a little bit implied. We don't have big scenes with this in it. No, it's the, more of our background, right? Our we research. don't want you to. Yeah, we're not going to bore it you as though it was paint drying. <laughs> That's for us. To this deal is with. for me to know, so that when I write the scenes, I understand the context. Yeah, and it gives it makes it more credible. Right, and we do have one scene with the senator, so it kind of makes I can yeah. write it in a more believable way uh, they they use their connections in the government this is our comic book in order to get insurance so it starts with situations that would put the lives of firefighters the police forces it's too risky for them so you can call a superhero if you have the insurance right if you don't have the insurance and you're stuck on a ledge and the firefighters you can can't get on you yes so in your initial scene He's trying. He needs to pay out of pocket, right? Because he doesn't have the insurance, but he doesn't want to fall off the ledge of the building, and it's right. too high up for the firefighters to yeah. save him. We started to expand on this to create this whole universe. It's very important to understand the financial world, the economics world, starting with Adam Smith, because he's yeah. The that's of really it. what started a lot of our economic research. It's because of this comic. That's right, and then I, we decided to call the villain the yeah, Invisible like Hand from Adam Smith. Right. Well, I wouldn't say nation. villain. I'd say antagonist. I call him our anti-hero. That's probably because he word. really is the hero of our story. He's the main character, right? So he is the villain, but he's the main character, which sort of makes him the hero, protagonist in a weird way, the protagonist. Yeah. So we our story is based on the Invisible Hand, which I thought was hilarious because when I heard I read Adam Smith's Invisible Hand, I'm mm-hmm. like, I know he's making reference to God because he was a minister. He, that's right. That's right. right. And, and people use the invisible hand today, and I I'm, I'm doubt that they're religious, and they don't understand There's that. There's two words they use, and whenever they use it, I'm like, you want me to take you seriously? In the markets. <laughs> yeah. When I worked in New York, I worked in, at Bloomberg, which is a financial data news company, and you hear this all the time. They say the invisible hand, the hand of the market, or animal spirits, if you can believe or it. market forces. Market forces. All of these are allusions to non-existent controls on the system. That somehow things are working uh, pre-planned by exactly. some entity like above. Everything will work out in the markets if you just allow them. It's like, oh my God, you you have to put it back. That comes from Smith, and Smith believed in God. Yes, and he, God he, he had actually had uh, um, invisible hand. That sounds like a great, a great villain. super villain That's name. That's right. Right. So we ha- we tied them into a lot. We even looked at banking and the origins of banking, which led us to the Knights Templar. In the West. And we made them, we added, of course, a little bit of uh, magical realism, of magical well, yeah, I mean, element, we, we, fantasy elements. Fantasy elements. And where when characters. you take some of the mythology of the Knights Templar and how they say that they... Found the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail. How can mm-hmm. we forget the Holy Grail? So we, we tied that in. So that our main character... Don't give too much away from the second volume. I'll just say he lives for a very long time. Yes. He has a very long extended lifetime. And I won't explain why. But um, then it ties into our story on... He really follows the history of the U.S. Yes. And so one of our taglines is, it takes a few lifetimes to be a good capitalist. Another is, truth, justice, and how much does it pay? I guess, I don't know if this will be a webtoon. We're sort of debating what we're going to do with this now. We'll see. If people show interest in um, our anthology, which is Ghost Metal, then we'll introduce stories on webtoon like Past Due. Right. I think that's a good way to go about Mm -hmm. it. Uh, The thing, too, is is you just said something very important. That not all Do tell. (laughs) Not all, all of the research that you do will be seen oh no it's no, like no. a skeleton and the flesh goes over it that skeleton is for you to make the story believable you and i are on the maximum side of that spectrum other people just do a little bit of research just enough yeah. to get what they want we just get really lost in our world so I, you don't have to go to the extent that we are i, I really but, love manga mm-hmm. and when i see the manga artists mm-hmm. they get lost in their world mm-hmm. And that's what inspires me. When I look at those guys, I'm like, man, they thought of everything. I mean, they're, they're like, you know, you, you read something, um, Kazuo Koike. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. The guy that did Loma for Cub wrote right. it. One of my Had, favorite books, fantastic. never mind manga. But he would have such crazy details tell you, you know, that mafia is the acronym for 
you know, Morte Anella Italia and, and all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, I didn't know Mafia the cats was eyes. the Italians against the French, right. against Napoleon. And I thought, you can do that in a comic? You can make it actually kind of like yeah. interesting. He had another one where the, the ninjas were able to tell the time of day by looking at cats' eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, 20th Century Boys, for example, mm-hmm. Urusawa is fantastic. Right. I mean, this guy just thought through a real supervillain. Mm-hmm. In a very real way. Yeah, they get more psychological as well, which I like. I really like, you know, if I take a overused acting term, what's my motivation? We've mentioned research. In, we've mentioned mythology. We showed examples. We showed examples of current events and historical events, but also just books that you love. Like, we love Alexandre Dumas mm-hmm. and The Count yeah. of Monte Cristo, The Three Musketeers. So we wanted Past Due to have a bit of an epic He also did a story. lot of research, too. Well, he had a team that did research right, for him. Right, right. Yeah. I can understand why. Yeah, but he... If you're going to write a lot, you need help with research. Like, there was a real guy named D'Artagnan who was Louis XIV's favorite musketeer. Mm. You know, it, it wasn't just something that he made up. Mm-hmm. He actually drew from history. Right, and that's why I think it makes it so And much we more will endearing. have an episode just on Alexandre Dumas because we love him so much. For Black History Month. For next month, for February, and on his father. That's right, the general. Alex Dumas, as he liked to be called, who was a general in the French Revolution. But we'll do that, so stay tuned. We'll have those in February. So let's take another one of our stories. And this isn't just to promote our stories. I will encourage everyone to read them. It's just, it's just to show how we read something and how we apply that to our stories. Right. And another one that, again, is very different is Samurai Elf, right. which is your tag on Twitter. Uh, the idea for Samurai Elf was born during the uh, kind of after 9-11. Right. And we were living in New York. And it was the lead up to the war in Iraq. Well, what's interesting is that first it was just going to be a silly fantasy. It's going to be regular fantasy. Then the whole lead up to Iraq happened. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about my mom because my mom lived through the Spanish Civil War. That's right. My grandfather. So I started thinking about militarism. So Miguel's father is American. His mother is Spanish. Right. Okay. We'll just continue Just for those who need to know. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I started to think, you know, what motivates a lot of this conflict and imbue it with uh, more of an exploration of fascism? Because our main characters are young teenagers, right? how younger generations have to deal with the mess of older generations, Yes. of how they can feel trapped in a world that they didn't create, but they have to deal with it. Right. And the idea of the one Yes, and, and of the course, one, yeah. and, you know, the one is always seen as good. But what happens if you're not set right? That's right. Most hero stories, the hero is the one. He's the savior. Right. So, That's always the archetype. I mean, our villain is pretty strong, and villain is very, I guess, like the fascist with his army, his mm-hmm. minion army. Lopped. Lopped. Which actually was. And we call his army the horde. And it was inspired by. It was another name for Loki. Oh, really? I yes. forgot about that. There's another name for I Loki. I forgot about that. And I used that. And even the planet Tyr mm-hmm. was another name for, well, it's the Nordic war. God, God of War. That's right. Because the Nazis so used to carry... So this is a carry... fantasy, sci-fi fantasy. Right. Set on the planet Tyr. Tyr. And the Nazis, I was inspired to call it Tyr because the Nazis, when I was reading, would carry a little insignia of Tyr with them, the God of War. Ah, oh, that's right. I do remember reading that. And that's why it inspired me. Okay, so I'm gonna, I wanted to create this world where we... Discussed at night. View fantasy as a way. It, it's a weird mix of German and Japanese. For two reasons. And then we have some Celtic in there as well. And uh... But the reason I named it Samurai Elf mm-hmm. was because the samurai were also mis- misappropriated mm-hmm. to motivate the Japanese. That's, it. That's right. So I to was fight using in World the elf. War II. Yeah, the elf part was the Nordic, mm-hmm. which was misappropriated by the Nazis, and the samurai was misappropriated by the Japanese. Mm. And I wanted to explore that. And to me, fantasy is very much almost like setting up this, uh, you could say a virtual world mm-hmm. where you're not tied into it. and It's like a parallel world. Where it's safe to discuss ideas. Right, that's true. Because what it's happens... It's not real. It's fantasy. Right, but you discuss ideas. That's right. Whereas if you're dealing in the real, now you have to discuss people, events, and all sorts of stuff. And mm-hmm. 
it can get really loopy. But mm-hmm. if you can just distance yourself and just talk about ideas, mm-hmm. that's where I see fantasy lies in. Yeah, yeah, that's the strength of fantasy. What we do is we take ideas to their extremes. Yes, because it's it's about almost setting up a virtual world where you play ideas out. Yeah, exactly. After doing research, I think, unless I'm forgetting a step, we like plotting out our story. Yes and no. <laughs> we kind of do both at the same time. It's really strange. That's the thing with research. You always are learning, and it's very nonlinear. Mm-hmm. So don't expect it. It's like, oh, wow. And then all of a sudden, it's like you get distracted, and you're off on the Knights Templar or you know mm-hmm. King Arthur or something crazy from, I don't know, money printing. <laughs> it's bizarre. And I'm, I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan in terms of how he breaks down the stories and stuff. Oh, yeah, I'll put links to him. For a writer, it mm-hmm. gets you thinking. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. Most people might not know that the Philosopher's Stone and the Holy Grail are one and the same. And you do you learn that from research. Mm-hmm. And then you think, okay, well, what could this be together? Mm-hmm. And that's the beauty of it. You're learning, but you're also applying that learning. Yeah, If you, instead of reading just the story, what is the source of that story? Right. Will really inspire you and make it original. Right. There, There's a quote or maybe it's just a general saying, where if you steal from one, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. (laughs) Yeah. And what you'll find out, too, is that there are many different versions of the stories that you think are. That's true, too. And then you start realizing. Or you might think, hey, this is the greatest idea ever. For example, I had a character, and I was like, man, this is great. Look it up. Boy, this is a Polynesian tale. Did not know that. Yeah. Well, that brings us to another person that I love and is a huge influence is Carl Jung. Yes. And the whole collective unconscious. Which is freaky. Yeah. And that's what uh, Campbell was talking about, archetypes that we might yeah. see yeah, exactly. and use. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's a gen- You can read certain things just really set off ideas and analysis. Mm-hmm. Carl Jung, I think three writers who are definitely worth reading, or you can just listen to lectures on Mm -hmm. YouTube or something. Carl Jung, Nietzsche. Yeah, he gets really misconstrued. I I think he he He, does. I mean, let's get rid of people think he... Like, they even say Carl Jung was uh, (laughs) anti-Semitic. But he actually, it came out in documents later, he actually helped the U.S. government do analysis of Hitler. Nietzsche broke his friendship with Wagner. Yeah, over his anti-Semitism, right. and it Wagner was his sister that ruined him. Yeah, it's his sister is very anti-Semitic and very pro-fascistic. Uh, but Nietzsche, I think Nietzsche and Carl Jung, geniuses, absolute yeah. geniuses. But I think Carl Jung had it more right. I mean, not that I'm anybody, but <laughs> Nietzsche You're thought. You're somebody <laughs> because the I Nietzsche thought. Once things are deconstructed, you need to create a new Uberman. You need to create something new to fill the void of your broken religion. Let's get that quote straight. God is dead because we have killed him. We have killed him. Not that he was saying God is dead. He knew innately we need to have something. But his whole concept was we have to build something up. We have to construct something. Whereas Carl Jung said... There is something there that exists with, we, it doesn't, we don't construct it, it's already there. Right. What My, my favorite thing of Nietzsche was his um, tragedy oh, and uh, his approach his... to it and, and, and against the whole Apollonian, the whole structured happy ending or an ending. Mm-hmm. It, it was the sort of like, oops, there's an accident. Right, right. And, and how he loved uh, Oedipus and stuff. To me, that was very critical and something that inspired actually Samurai Elf. And another one too, Machiavelli the Prince. Yeah. These are three Past fantastic due. things to read mm-hmm. in order to influence your stories. Past due. He influenced very much past due in, in the, he of, is how the, he's thinking. He does such a good analysis of power structures. That's why, why they, they do what they do and their rationale for doing it. Whether it, you're a prince or a politician or a leader of some sort. It's the playbook. Mm-hmm. And he dropped the playbook, and they hate him for yeah, it. Yeah, if you want a motivation for why your villain does something, read The Prince. So the, for me, those are three big books if you really want to add mm-hmm. to your villain, to the psychological makeup of your characters, mm-hmm. or to analyze what type of story that you want to do. 
there's one writer that I, I he just passed away last year. Hmm. Not a writer, but a professor of anthropology, David Graeber. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about him. Not much, but I think he's important for world creation. Because say you don't want all these Machiavellian characters or villains or all mm-hmm. this, and you really want to imagine something different. I think the debt the first 5,000 years is great for that. Because it breaks you. It, anthropology has a way of getting you to see different cultures. And he was just fantastic at it. Mm-hmm. So if you want to see outside of this is the way it is, it's a pyramid structure and whatnot, Dave's the guy you go to. Because mm-hmm. he explains it so simply and so beautifully. And I really do feel What that, exactly did he explain? Um, just how a lot of how religion affects money and how we view it as an accounting system. Even sins are, are, are like an accounting system. And when you start thinking about it and how that affects money, you start thinking, wow. And then you think, what if there was a world where it didn't work that way? Mm-hmm. And you could create a whole other fantastical world which didn't have to do with that. Mm-hmm. And one of the critiques he had, and it wasn't in debt, it was a different critique, was on superheroes and he said you know essentially superheroes are there to keep the system and even the villain doesn't really change the system he just wants to be the lord of the system Mm -hmm. so you don't have any radical characters that are wanting to radically change the system so he is one of those thinkers that comes every once in a while it is interesting to read people that look at things from a completely different perspective right because if you are building a world and you want it to be unique Mm-hmm. It is really cool for readers to read something that's different than our world. Right. So I can tell you, debt the first 5,000 years was like a mind bend mm-hmm. for me. Because mm-hmm. there were things that I just took for, ah, oh, that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. And when I read it, I'm like, wow. you know. Yeah, like it. what is money? Money is, okay, I'll pay you back later. Right, it's promises. That is basically and... money, historically speaking. Oh. It's not, I'm going to go dig for gold. Right. It's not, I'll give you three chickens, you give me a cow, which is an unfair exchange anyways. <laughs> yeah. It's, Want a chicken foot? <laughs> it's the very natural, okay, I'll take this now and I'll catch you later. Right. And I, I think, but he just sort of expanded it and he talked about the effects of Buddhism on money and all these different places. And then he talked about, you know, cultures that don't have money the way we, we do. Mm-hmm. And then I, I think if you're going to be be building worlds Mm -hmm. this is the kind of book you want to read yeah let's say you're building an alien world they wouldn't have money like we have right so read something that tells you different ways that you can trade for things this episode was a little bit difficult to approach because research is so individual to the person and to the story so that's why i tied in what we researched and how we applied it to our own stories i'll say one thing about it always be open to the happy accident especially if you write comedy if you misread something you don't know where that's gonna gonna lead you to and it could be somewhere hilarious and now it's time for the fantastically terrible character or creature and what is that today what Kenyan? which is it is, well, first of all, Wakinian is the Lakota word for thunder. And they are known as thunder spirits, thunder birds, and they have other names. And they're these powerful sky spirits from the Sioux mythology. And they take on these giant forms of birds with wings that make sound and thunder, and their eyes that shoot out lightning, and they're awesome. And what's wrong with they us that we haven't done awesome. it yet? And that's it for today. Seven Robots Fantastically Terrible Podcast is by Miguel Guerra and Susie Diaz. Our theme song is by Susie. The best way to support our podcast is to leave a review on iTunes. This helps others to find us and we can see your name and personally thank you live on the show. For more information on the episode, including links to everything we referenced, please visit our website at (laughs) www.7robots.com slash podcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.